Biotechnology is any technology based on our understanding of living things. By understanding how organisms work, we're able to either use or modify these systems to be more useful to us. In this video, we'll look at enzyme technology, engineering bacteria to produce human insulin, and how genetically modified plants are produced using bacteria vectors to introduce new genes. We'll also look at how fermenters are used to produce large quantities of microorganisms very quickly. Firstly, let's look at how our knowledge of enzymes has been put to use in different ways. We saw in the B2 unit that enzymes are biological catalysts. One of the uses of enzymes we saw was digestion. This group of enzymes is also used in washing powders to break down stains that are difficult for soaps and detergents. Lipases break down fats and oils and proteases break down proteins. Washing powders with these enzymes in are known as biological washing powders. Because enzymes are made of proteins and they denature at high temperatures, biological washing powders should not be used over 40 degrees or they won't be as efficient. Other uses of enzymes include how they're used in the production of different foods. Sweets that have a caramel soft center are made using an enzyme. Sucrose is a sugar that's hard. Invertase breaks sucrose down into glucose and fructose, making it softer. Glucose and fructose are also sweeter tasting than sucrose. Invertase is produced by genetically modifying a yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, to produce the enzyme. Adding invertase to the sucrose before covering the hard caramel in chocolate allows the enzyme to slowly break it down, leaving a soft centre in the middle. To make cheese, you need to separate the curds and whey in milk. Traditionally, this was done using rennet extracted from the stomachs of calves killed for veal. Chymosin is the enzyme in rennet that does the job of separating the liquid and the solid. The gene for chymosin can be transferred into a bacteria and this GM bacteria will then produce chymosin to make cheese suitable for vegetarians. Calves produce chymosin because like all young mammals they need to be able to break down the proteins in milk. Lactose is one of the main sugars in milk and it's broken down by the enzyme lactase. Unusually, most adult humans can still digest milk because they continue to produce lactase throughout their lives, not just when young. Some people, however, are lactose intolerant, which means they can't produce lactase as an adult. To allow these people to drink milk, we can use immobilized lactase. This involves fixing the enzyme lactase into gel pellets. In this way, the enzyme can be easily removed from the milk once it has worked without having to treat the milk any further. To produce the enzymes we've just looked at, the gene for them needs to be added to a bacteria or yeast. We now need to look at how this is done, and then we'll take a look at how the microorganisms are grown in fermenters. In the unit B2, we saw how genes can be added from one species to another and it work because every species uses DNA to make proteins in the same way. One of the examples we looked at then was how the gene for insulin could be added to a bacteria to produce human insulin to treat type 1 diabetics. The first stage of this process is identifying the correct gene. When it's been located, the gene is isolated by cutting it out using a restriction enzyme. Restriction enzymes cut DNA at specific base sequences, leaving sticky ends. Sticky ends are where one end, one strand rather, of the DNA overhangs the other. Because each restriction enzyme cuts at the same DNA sequence each time, it will always produce the same sticky ends. A plasmid is removed from a bacteria and cut using the same restriction enzyme that the gene was cut out with. The gene and plasmid both have the same sticky ends, allowing the gene to be attached to the plasmid. DNA ligase is another enzyme which joins the DNA together. We now have a recombinant plasmid which can be put back into the bacteria. The bacteria is now able to make insulin. Sometimes we want to add a gene to a plant rather than to a bacteria or yeast. For example, we might want to add a gene that allows the plant to produce an insecticide. This would be an advantage compared to a farmer spraying insecticide over the whole crop as only those insects actually eating the crop would be affected and no insecticide would be washed away and wasted by the rain. Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria that lives in soil and it produces a toxin that's poisonous to insects. 
the gene for this toxin, known as Bt toxin, can be isolated and inserted into the plasmid of a bacteria in the way we've just seen. However, in this case, we want to use a specific bacteria called Agrobacterium tumefaciens because this bacteria is able to add genes to a plant's genome. It does this using its plasmid and creates crown galls or tumours in plants. By allowing the genetically modified agrobacterium to infect leaf discs of the target plant, tumours will form from which whole plants can be grown up. These plants will be transgenic and include the gene for Bt toxin. Another example of producing transgenic plants is adding flavonoids into tomatoes to produce purple tomatoes. There's some evidence that flavonoids might slow the growth of cancers. The cost of plants such as this is very high, meaning they're simply not affordable in the developing world where they're most likely to be needed. Once we have a microorganism that we want to grow, we need to be able to supply the ideal conditions for it. This is achieved in a fermenter. A fermenter is a sealed vessel which allows the conditions inside to be tightly controlled. The first thing to do is to sterilise the container so that the only microorganism inside is the one you want to grow. Once the fermenter is running, nutrients need to be supplied. To make sure these are evenly distributed, the fermenter is agitated and stirred using large paddles. Oxygen is also added to, to the fermenter so that the microorganisms can grow quickly. Temperature and pH can both affect the rate at which the microorganisms grow, so they need to be continually measured and adjusted to keep them at optimum levels. This fermenter setup can be used to grow bacteria and yeast that have had genes added to them so that they make products that are useful to us. Another way of using fermenters is growing up microorganisms where the microbe itself is useful. One example is the fungus fusarium, which can be eaten as an alternative source of protein to meat. This is known as mycoprotein because it's from a fungus and it has several advantages over using animals as a protein source. Firstly, it can be produced much faster than animal protein. Using a fermenter also takes up less space than either animals or plant crops and is more reliable than either of these as they don't depend on certain weather conditions. For this reason, mycoprotein can be produced anywhere in the world. It's cheaper as the nutrition for the fungus comes from the waste products of other processes. Finally, mycoprotein is healthier than most animal and plant sources of protein as it contains more fibre and less fat than meat. So biotechnology is all about using our knowledge of biology to make products. Enzyme technology produces biological washing powders, soft centre sweets, vegetarian cheese and lactose free milk. Genes can be added to bacteria using restriction enzymes to cut out the target gene and also the plasmid of a bacteria you're adding the gene to producing sticky ends which are joined together using ligase. Agrobacterium is used as a vector when we want to get a gene into a plant, for example the Bt toxin produced by Bacillus thuringiensis. Fermenters are vessels that provide the optimum growing conditions for microorganisms. Aseptic precautions are taken beforehand and when operating the nutrient levels, oxygenation, temperature and pH are all carefully controlled to keep them at optimum levels. Agitation ensures all of these conditions are kept consistent throughout the fermenter.